Harry Graver, um, start as an actor before uh, cinematography, as a cinematographer. Were you an actor first? Well, yes. You were an actor. I wasn't. I studied acting You a lot, studied. Yes. With who? A lot of good people. Well, I was with the Portland Civic Theater in Portland. Oh, okay. And then I came to L.A. to be an actor. And so you're from Northwest? Yeah, Portland. Uh-huh. I studied with... Um, Luckily, with Jeff Corey, Charles Conrad, Lucille Ball, Lee J. Cobb. Lee, uh, Lucille Ball taught acting? Yes. Lee, I was in an acting class on La Cienega. Right. With Lee J. Cobb, and he had to leave to do a movie, and Lucille Ball came in. She fell in. And she's the one that told me, she said, look, nobody is going to help you. <laughs> You've got to do it yourself. Make your own short movie, write a play, write a screenplay, whatever. Don't wait for someone to hire you. Make it happen. I took that advice and went out when I was 23 and made my first feature. And which was, what was? What was it? Mm -hmm. Well, it was called Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And then a distributor put it in the drive-ins as a sort of a sexy movie, which it wasn't, and he called it The Embracers. Uh-huh. And it played around, and then I've, I've, <clears throat> I've redone it. I went back 35 years later uh-huh. and played a homeless bum on Hollywood Boulevard going through the garbage cans. Uh-huh. And the girl who was in the movie with me mm-hmm. pulls up and sees me, and we eyes connect. And she's rich and driving a brand new convertible and everything, but we don't talk. So I shot a new ending in color because the film was in black and white. Right. I'm going back to the original title, Hollywood, which no one's used mm-hmm. except one movie in the um, way in the early talkies. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's been destroyed. As a filmmaker, uh, looking back, Hollywood. You came here, you know, you're very young. It's changed a lot. You've met the giants of Hollywood stars, the directors, the producers. You've dealt with the best. Uh, Change. Tell me about the change of Hollywood. Well, Hollywood, the the city, uh, I mean, I'll tell you, when when I came to Hollywood, uh, and I worked in the Vogue Theater and the Chi- right. Grauman's Chinese. I was an assistant manager there. And movie stars, character actors, all kinds of people. Right. It was nothing to see them strolling the boulevard. In Hollywood at night. Boulevard, yes. You know, John Derrick and his wife would come into the Chinese. And, mm-hmm. and I used to, and I worked in Beverly Hills in the theater, and I used to let in Mr. Hitchcock, Alfred Hitchcock, mm-hmm. and Jean Renoir. Bing Crosby and people like that. Right. Down Hollywood Boulevard, you, some nights you'd see Peter Ustinov or Jose Ferrar. Uh-huh. You don't see that anymore. It's dark. Hollywood <laughs> Boulevard was lit up. There were no bars on the windows. There were bright lights and it was beautiful. What do you think happened? Is it the foreigners that moved on Hollywood Boulevard, like the Iranians, like the Turks, like the Chinese, the, the all... Everybody is, or uh, they're foreigners on Hollywood Boulevard. All the owners of the managements of the uh, stores, they don't know what Hollywood Boulevard was. Well, well they that's just, yeah. what ruined it, don't you think, Gary? They just let it run down, and you would think they would have kept it up like the Third Street Promenade uh, or something. Exactly. Because it's such a famous place. Hollywood did move over to Third Street Promenade. I mean, it's lit up right. there. It's, why don't they take care of it down in Hollywood well, Boulevard? Well, they're supposed like to that. be doing. They keep threatening. They keep to do thre- it. they keep doing it for years and years, Gary. And I'm sick of the Chamber of Congress keep saying we're redoing Hollywood. They got a new sign up there. Remember, mm-hmm. I was there for the opening. <sighs> You've been around here like I've been. I was a child actor out here, and it makes me tired what the Chamber of Congress and all these people of Hollywood Boulevard are doing to our boulevard. It's, it's terrible. It's it's, like, it's worse than 42nd Street used to be on New York City. Well, it's like Skid Row. That's exactly it. Gary Graver, Orson Welles. Got to get, got to jump right away to Orson Welles. 
the most powerful actor, director, Rita Hayworth's husband, married to Rita Hayworth, one of the greats, Orson Welles, powerful from the day of radio, Joseph Cotton, mm -hmm. all these great stars. Mercury Theater. Mercury Theater. War of the Worlds. Working with Orson Welles as a young man must have been a joy. It must have been an absolute joy. Well, Harry. it was great because Orson was truly a very bright, intelligent, creative, uh, you know, yes, yes, actor, yes. actor, producer. And, and people, I must stress this a little bit, that Orson was a producer. He produced everything he did in the theater with John Houseman. Right. And he, was, he, was a, he produced things. He put them on. He got so, the money for the films, and he, he, and he had a lot of trouble getting money sometimes, didn't he? Yes, because Orson didn't really need a producer. He needed the money. Money. That's exactly what he did. But everybody in Hollywood is trying to get money. Orson was just famous for it. Mm -hmm. because Having lunches over it and trying to get money. Yes. It was that first lunch. This is, matter of fact, what is this right here? Show me this. Tell me about this. Is this is uh, Orson it, Welles at a meeting, or no, or, no, what we're is in this? we're in Paris. This is in Paris at one of a very very good restaurant. Uh -huh. No matter what we did, you got to straighten a little bit, I think. Yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, every evening we would go to a restaurant, and Orson would take all of a little group, small group, uh -huh. and we'd have the best meal. We always ate good. This is his sister right here, Gary. This one right here is his no, sister. No, that's the sister of Orson's companion, Oya. Companion. Her name oh. is... And this one is Oya. O Oya Kodar. That's his girlfriend. It was his girlfriend. His companion, Girl. girlfriend, uh, collaborator. Yeah. They co-wrote together. And uh -huh. best what friend year was this it. about, would you say? This one right here of Orson? This Gary? is about 1973. God, look at him. This is in Paris. Yeah, in Paris, we're doing... That's one of his favorite places, you know. He met Earth the Kit there. He developed Earth the Kit to become a big superstar of the world. That's where he met Earth the Kit. Mm-hmm, yes. And he just brought her, introduced her to American audiences. He did a lot that to a lot of stars. Like who else has he done it to? What other female stars that he has really... Well, he brought, uh, basically, he really brought his Mercury Theater group. To um, America. Agnes Moorhead. Right. Who we always considered a wonderful actor. Great. And um, he, uh, he, he that, that mostly he did it in the beginning with his Mercury Theater the Mercury people. Theater. Joseph Cotton and him were very, very close. Yes, very close. I interviewed Joseph, and he was telling me all about him. Now, this is Gary Graver and Orson togetherness. Look at you, Gary. Long hippie hair, huh? This is the days when you really... Can, you were a good-looking guy. Were you married then at the time? Uh, yes. Yes? And that's Orson has a funny kind of a... I see the outfit he's got. Let's look at this. crown on his head. Let me see, get back to this picture. Oh, yeah, I see it. He's got a crown up here. Yeah. Yeah, that's A crown good. of thorns. He looks pretty this happy. This was taken in Beverly Hills in a rented house. A rented house in Beverly Hills? Yeah. I like this one. On the radio, is this one right here? This is in, uh, uh, toward the end of his life, in a recording studio wow, in Hollywood. Wow, look how young. This is towards the end of his life, Gary? Yes. Good looking guy. And I think he, with his beard and his distinguished look, he got better looking and he lost weight, you see. Yeah, he lost a lot of weight, didn't he? Was he up and down all the time with his weight? Uh, up and down, but he was, he was always heavy. Heavy. He leaned toward being Where heavy. was he from originally? Kenosha, Wisconsin. Kenosha, Wisconsin. Orson Welles from Kenosha, Wisconsin. You brought a, you brought a clip that when Orson died, mm -hmm. you were very close to him because you were his cinematography for a long time on his films. And uh, I'm going to let you, who, Peter Bogdanovich introduces you. It explains itself. Explain. This is at Orson's Memorial, 19, November of 1985. Let's, let's see the clip, okay? Peter Bogdanovich. Very much. Orson was the best. How very pleasant. Good evening. 
Um, our next guest, uh, next speaker, uh, has been Orson's friend and cameraman for about 15 years, and a friend, very good friend, underline. Uh, he worked on the other side of the wind, an F for fake, and the dreamers, which we're going to see a little bit of, and a f film called Filming Othello. Um, would you welcome Gary Graver? The thing uh, that's sad to me, really, is that I want to talk to Orson. <laughs> now, I wish I could talk to him and tell him a lot of things right now. That's, that's what probably makes me feel saddest of all. Uh, but anyway, uh, working with Orson, much of, one couple of funny things have happened. Uh, it was very intense, and there was never a dull moment. And once I had my eye on the eyepiece and I was shooting, and Orson was right behind me, leaning over me. I could feel him there, and all of a sudden, it felt this sort of a little pain in the back, and all of a sudden, ah! His cigar had burnt right through my shirt. It was... And it was always something like that. I'd like, I'd like to thank uh, a lot of the people who, uh, who worked on the other side of the wind, the crew and crews uh, must fill half this place, for coming here today. Uh, the thing that uh, I really remember about Orson, I don't know why, uh, when I was a child in kindergarten, they put us down on a blanket and gave us chocolate milk and we had to go to sleep. And they would play us from time to time a recording of Oscar Wilde's The Happy Prince, narrated by Orson and uh, with Bing Crosby and Lorraine Tuttle, three people. And I, I, for some reason, I never ever forgot that story or, or his telling of it. Uh, you know, and I, it stuck with me from the time I was six years old and still today. And. Um, the story quickly is that of a statue of a, of a prince who uh, it's Christmas time and he wants to a little bird lands on him a swallow and he tells a swallow to take peel off his gold leaves and drop them around to the poor people so people can have a nice Christmas and have some food and the bird plucks out the prince's eyes anyway uh, then then the, the prince is thrown in a dust heap because he's no good anymore and, and along with the dead bird and as Orson said it as he said it in the recording Orson said, bring me, this is Oscar Wilde, bring me the two most precious things in the city, said God to one of his angels. And the angel brought him the dead bird and the leaden heart of the happy prince. Of what use are these, said the angel. And God said, in my kingdom of paradise, the swallow shall sing forevermore. And in my city of gold, the happy prince shall praise me. Well, I shall always think of Orson as the happy prince, and I think he really now is in his own city of gold. When you, when you talk about Orson today, how does Gary Graver feel that you knew this great genius? Wherever you go in the world, using the word Orson Welles, genius. How does Gary Graver put that together? Well, one of the things, um, it's ironic is that I'm still working with Orson mm -hmm. because I'm um, I'm uh, we're trying to finish this picture called The Other Side of the Wind yes which we made which is a very important picture because it's his last movie this was his last and it was we finished shooting it and everything and it only needs to be edited Orson left about 45 50 minutes edited mm -hmm himself personally right and we we're trying to put the post-production money together and finish it mm -hmm. and we have a lot of people saying they want to do it but nobody can seem to write a check out right so to finish we the got film. a couple of irons in the fire and it's been a revival in Orson's career because of the re-release uh, re re of Touch of Evil mm -hmm. And Citizen Kane being the best picture, American picture. What's your favorite film? You have a favorite film of Orson Welles, Gary? Well, I think Citizen Kane because it's so creative and so, um, uh, you know, just it's just marvelous. Did so, he ever tell you, know, you how long did that picture take to be made? It wasn't that long. I think Not about at three all. months or something Is that like it, that. Right? Yeah. A great movie in three months. Well, it's so creative because he was experimenting, and that's what he was 
basically an experimental filmmaker. Right. And theater, experimental theater man working in Hollywood. Right. Because he really started the theater. Yes. That's what he was, a yes. theater actor. And to become a film, you're using the word experimental. That's, that's, that's the genius of young people of today. There are some youngs out there, great geniuses of young kids today. Mm -hmm. Who do you find? Any, anyone around today? In that um, who do I like? Yes, of the young. Not people. a lot of people because everything seems to be a remake. Yes. And everything seems to be, to me really, a, a point and shoot kind of thing. Uh -huh. you know, just point the camera somewhere and, and shoot it instead of angles and, and character development and uh, working with the actors, etc. I shoot a lot of movies and uh, the, the directors hardly talk to the actors about anything mm -hmm. except go through that door, or go here, or do this, you know. You, from cinematography, then you developed into becoming a director. I started out as a director. You started out as then a Then I became a cameraman. Cameraman for Orson Welles. For how no. long did you work? Oh, no. No, no. No? For other people. For other people. Other how people. long did you work for Orson Welles? Fifteen years. Fifteen years. From 1970 to 85. What kind of... I did a lot of other movies at the same time. Right. But the situation was that once he got me working with him, yes. he said, now Gary, he said, I want you to have this arrangement with me that if you get a job, come to me and tell me, and I'll tell you if I need you or not. Mm -hmm. So that's okay. And that's what I did. And if I'd say, oh, I'm going to do a Gary Coleman movie of the week or something, or I'm going to go to Utah or something, he'd say, fine. Or a lot of pictures I didn't do because he says, no, we must shoot, Gary. Uh -huh. I need you. So I would go with Orson first. Mm -hmm. And the reason I wanted to work with Orson is because I didn't think there were enough Orson Welles movies, and I wanted to see more, mm -hmm. and I had no idea that he would ever ask me to join him. Right. Not just as his cameraman, but, but as his friend, collaborator, um, you know, all around the world with him, mm -hmm. go everywhere. What have you learned, Gary Graver, from Orson Welles working with this genius? What have you learned? Well, I learned uh, many important things, you know, wor working with actors, uh -huh. which I always like to do anyway. Was he easy well, working with actors, Orson Welles? Very was good. He? Was he? Oh, yeah, very good. Mm -hmm. And he was, uh, and uh, of course, lighting. Lighting. And a lot of camera techniques and things, and he mm -hmm. knew exactly what he wanted. We didn't have the, you know, the monitors to look at, so Orson had to trust me. Uh-huh. He would, I would, the method was, he would, he would have the camera in his, to his eye, right. and he'd say, come here, Gary. And then he'd move his head to the side. He said, this is it. See it? Uh -huh. And I had to make it exactly right, because when he saw the dailies, mm -hmm. if it wasn't exactly what he wanted, well, I got hell about it. Did you think Orson Welles was another, that Italian director, which I love, Cleone, the Western, he did all his Western... Leone? Leone. To me, Leone is a genius, too. Yes, I, I like Leone. Love Leone's. I think he is an actor. Yeah. He made Clint Eastwood. He made so many stars. He started the spaghetti westerns yes. in Italy. They and he them. had a film ruined, too, oh, Once God. Upon a Time in America. That was my favorite. They wrecked One that. They wrecked it terrible. I think he's a genius. He they, died young, too. Young, 60. young, 60. Was he 60? Now his sister is uh, directing, I think. His sister, I think she is. Leone. Really? I yeah, didn't know that. I think. I'm I not sure. That. But there's another genius, see? I can, mm -hmm. I like, I like, there's two geniuses, Orson Welles and Leone. Very and stylistic. Same, very, very. And they treated their actors real good. Working with Orson Welles on this film, The Other Side of the Wind, the stars in the movie. Oh, you brought a clip. Yep, how Tell I met Orson. How you really met Orson Welles making this film. 
So let's show the clip, okay? I just felt the camaraderie would be there, and it was. So one day in 1970, near the 4th of July, I was at Schwab's drugstore in Hollywood. And I read in Variety that Orson Welles was in town at the Beverly Hills Hotel. I went back to the phone booth, called him up. And to my surprise, he answered the phone. Hello? I said, oh, uh, Orson Welles? Yes, who is this? I introduced myself, Gary Graver. I said, I'm an American cameraman, etc., etc." He says, well, I'm very busy. I'm on my way to the airport. He says, I've got to go to New York to make a picture. He took my number and he said, call me later. I said, okay, that's fine, that's pretty good. So I went home, I drove up Laurel Canyon to my house. As I pulled in my driveway, the phone was ringing. I ran into my house, picked up the phone. Gary, this is Orson. Get over to the Beverly Hills Hotel right away. I've got to talk to you. Wow, it was sh surprise and shock. I got in my car, drove over to the Beverly Hills Hotel, and there he was. And I was extremely nervous meeting Orson. I was in awe and I was impressed to, to be in his company. And we sat down and chatted for a while, and he said to me, he says, I have a great idea for a movie, and I would like to work with you. He said, you're the second cameraman that's called me up. Only two cameramen have ever called me up and said they wanted to work with me. The first one was Greg Toland on Citizen Kane. He says, now you, so it must mean good luck. He says, I'm going to go to New York and make a picture, and when I come back, we'll start some tests and make the other side of the wind. And as we chatted along, chatted along, all of a sudden, he grabbed me by the back of the neck and threw me down on the ground. And I was down there, looking. And he was holding me, and I wonder what the hell was going on. It was very strange. And he leaned on me, he pushed me down, he said, shh, 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 he said, shh, shh, don't make a noise. And he looked up, and he was looking out the window all around. I thought, what the hell have I gotten myself into here? What's going on? Here I was with Orson Welles, laying flat on the rug in his Beverly Hills bungalow, not knowing what the hell was going on. And then after a few minutes, he said, come on, get up. And we got up. I said, well, what, was, what, was, what was that? He said, out the window. He said, it's the actress, Ruth Gordon. If she saw me in here, she'd come in and talk, 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 talk. He said, I, I want to talk to you. So that was my first meeting with Orson. When Orson Welles came back from New York, he called me and I... Uh, began a series of tests, and I was very nervous about it. Uh, the tests, as you see here, are shots of Orson sitting in the Beverly Hills Hotel bungalow that he rented, and I was shooting him. And these tests were made with the beginning of a test to see for lighting and how he looked and everything, and what I could do if I was a cameraman. And then we proceeded to shoot the other side of the wind. Uh, I just want to run you down the cast list of who eventually ended up on the other, other side of the wind. John Houston, Peter Bogdanovich, Oya Kodar, Robert Random, Lily Palmer, Edmund O'Brien, Cameron Mitchell, Mercedes McCambridge, Norman Foster, Dennis Hopper, Paul Stewart, Susan Strasberg, Tony O'Selwert, Claude Chabrol, Stefan Audran, Paul Mazursky, Henry Jaglum, George Jessel, John Carroll, Benny Rubin, Peter Jason, Gregory Sierra, Dan Tobin, and Curtis Harrington. One of the actors... Okay. Only me. Boy, you had some great giants of the stars there in that film. Even Georgie Jessel? Yes. <laughs> Tell me about Georgie Jessel in this Orson movie. Orson loved Georgie Jessel. Did he? He, loved, he loved comedians and offbeat things like that. And he loved burlesque comedians and Red vaudeville Bu people. I do. Oh, he would like me too, boy. I'll tell you something. Uh, Georgie Jessel, he loved, uh, Was I think that was last Georgie Jessel's last film, wasn't it? Oh, yes. I think so. Yes. And Georgie Jessel smoked cigars, and Orson smoked cigars. Did the cigar smoking bother you uh, on the set that when they smoked? Like, he always had a cigar in his mouth. No. No? No. It didn't bother the actors, some of the actors? No. On the set? Yeah. No. Susan Strasberg was in this. She was a very dear friend of mine. I just loved her. Yes. John Huston, great, great filmmaker. Tell me about him. John was with us about um, four weeks in the uh, end of the shooting in 1975. We did a lot of work without them, right. without him and the other cast. And then we were in Arizona for a month in this big ranch house right. filming, which we made our, which we made our set. Uh -huh. And he was great. I mean, you know, and the, the actor, I mean, John stayed in a, you know, little 
premium motel. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if you're an actor and you stay at the best place. Absolutely. And to be there. But he was a wonderful character. And one evening I s sat up all night, just myself, like a fly on the wall. Picking listening. his brain, <laughs> listening to him. No, no, listening to Orson and, Orson and him. Houston. Oh, really? They argued? Did they ever argue? So here we have the film with the two giants uh -huh. and legends, Orson Welles and John Houston. Uh -huh. And I know everybody wants to see. Everybody asked me, when is it going to be finished? Right. We're working on it, folks. <laughs> We're working on it. <laughs> Let's go back to uh, what you're doing now. I like the, to the know. Crew. Right. Huh? Okay. Oh, you, oh the crew. This yeah. is the, what is this one right here, the crew? Now, we did a picture called F for Fake. Uh-huh. And um, this is the entire crew of the picture. The entire crew? There's myself, the cameraman, with the earphones on. I've got my camera. Uh -huh. There's the recording, Niagara recording, doing the sound. Right. Here's Orson's cue cards <laughs> and the light for the cue cards. Open up so I can see it. Uh, and then here's Orson's key light uh -huh. across a, a two-by-four on a couple of stands. Yes, 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 I see it. So Very because a, a lot of the film was just Orson talking, uh -huh. I had, uh, I was the crew. I see. Tell me about The Yellow Brick Road. You just did a film. I just produced a movie. I fell into it. I guess I'm switching careers yeah. because From I was... From there to... The, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I photographed this film. Right. But I was asked to be the... Director. Co-producer and the co-director. Uh-huh. Called Murder on the Yellow Brick Road with a bunch of actors, mm -hmm. including you. Yes, I played a security guard. Thank you. You gave me a, you gave me a few days' work. Thank you, Gary. Yes. <laughs> and it's it with... It's with an actor named Ross Hagen who was in a lot of movies and right. TV shows, and I worked with a lot. And Nancy Kwan. I love Nancy Kwan. And yes. um, we have uh, Angus McFadden, who was the fourth lead in Braveheart, uh -huh. and in Spartacus, the new one. Uh -huh. And uh, we had the playmate of August, and uh, a lot of good characters. Did you actors. do the leeches? The leeches. Look yeah. at this. The leeches. Oh, my God. This is uh, some new the work. The Leeches. And this one is what? The this, first is a, one? this is a film by Ray Manzarek, the keyboard artist of The Doors. The, oh, yes. And a story by Jim Morrison. And The Long Ride Home. Boy, oh, boy. Eric. Yeah, this Eric, is, these are current things I'm Eric working, Roberts uh, working a lot. The Long Ride Home with Eric Roberts. Ernest Bornine. Boy. Yeah. And what's this one right here? This we did last year with Gary Busey. Oh, this and is Quinley, that story of that l girl. Quigley the dog. Yeah, the and, dog, and, yeah. And uh, Oz Perkins, Anthony Perkins' son, who's uh -huh. wonderful, a wonderful actor. Anthony Perkins had a son?